You know, so many of our worship songs are just prayers. We're calling out to our Creator. We're calling out to God. We're worshiping Him through song, but we can also worship Him through our, our prayers. I mean, you look at the Psalms. So many of those are just prayers of David written down and put to music. So as we continue, these next couple of songs are songs that seek our Lord and ask Him to come in and be with us. I'd like you to just pray these with us as we sing them, as we lift up this praise to our God. Lord, we seek your face, your spirit, truth, and grace. Breathe on us, spirit, breathe on us. Seek your face, spirit, truth, and grace. Breathe on us, spirit, breathe on us. Yes, Lord, we seek your face, spirit, truth, and grace. Breathe on us, spirit, breathe on us. Lord, we seek your face, spirit, truth, and grace. Breathe on us, spirit, breathe on us. Be exalted, be exalted, be exalted, oh Lord. Seek your face, Spirit. 
let your wind blow. Let your fire fall. Jesus Christ. We believe in your Holy Spirit that counsels us. We invite your entity here today. God, we want to be in your presence. Please speak to us no matter where we are right now in our personal lives. We believe that you can touch us and help us and move us forward and redeem us and restore us. Holy Spirit, I pray that we would hear your message today. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Good morning. Great to see you this morning. Um, we ask the question why a lot of times, and I think it's a great question. I love asking that question. I love being asked that question. I think it helps us wrestle with some things that maybe we, we'd rather not sometimes, or we just need to take some time to think through some things. You know, as a dad of four kids, you know, there have been those times that I was asked questions, why? Why is the sky blue? Why is the sun red or orange or yellow, whatever color they're thinking of at the time? You know, and one of my favorite, it kind of caused me to, you know, pull my hair out trying to answer a question, why do brown cows eat green grass and give white milk? Yeah, good, good luck answering that question. But you know, there's some great why questions. Why do we do that? And I think a lot of times churches, we, we do some strange things. Believers tend to do some strange things. But if you know why we do what we do, then, then it might not seem so strange after all. So that's kind of the, the hope, the goal behind this whole series is to connect the why to the what. Why matters. You know, why, why do you get together so much, and why do you keep inviting me to church? Why do we gather? We, we've taken a look at that, that message, that idea. Why do you dunk people? Why do you dunk people? I mean, we've got a beautiful baptistry, one of the, the most incredible that I've really ever seen with the waterfall, the baptismal, just a beautiful thing. Why do we dunk people in that baptismal? Why do we baptize people? Why do you serve a little juice in a little cup and some crackers and call it a supper, the Lord's Supper, communion? Why do you do that? You know, weird becomes wonderful and confusing becomes clear when you know why, when you know why. Today, we want to explore the idea of why pray? Why pray? Well, here's a big idea. Prayer is experiencing the presence and the power of God. Prayer is experiencing the presence and the power of God. Now, that's great to say, but what's the point of prayer? Can you really change God's mind? Does He even care in the first place? And can you even get through to Him? You know, email and texting have certainly become a way of life for most of us in our culture today. It can be either very convenient or it can be frustrating. Have you ever sent an email or a text and it just mysteriously vanished somewhere out in cyberspace? And sometimes prayer feels like that too, doesn't it? George Buttrick, a pastor from mid 20th century, said, Prayer seems a spasm of words lost in a cosmic indifference. Now, 
He wrote that back in 1942 before our fast-paced world of texting and email and instant messaging. And we seem to have less time today for real conversation, let alone taking time to reflect. You know, I think the speed of technology is leaving us with this constant nagging that there's just not enough time to do all that we need to do. We're, we're moving faster than ever before. We're jumpy, we're frazzled, we're nervous, we're tired, we're, we're running short on time. So into a life that seems already way behind, how in the world do you fit in time to talk to God? Even if we are able to talk to God, would he listen? Is prayer just a spasm of words cast out into the cosmic somewhere? Do our requests even get heard? Do they seem trivial to a very busy God? Can, can you get through? Why pray? I want to give you a couple of different reasons why I believe that we should pray and why we have the motivation to pray. First of all, we pray because we are created to pray. You know, every religious faith has some form of prayer. Tribal people for centuries have been pleading and singing and dancing and jumping before their gods for healing rain and, and good crops and protection. Ancient civilizations like the Aztec even went as far to add human sacrifices to get the attention of their gods. Muslims stop five times a day to face toward Mecca and pray to Allah. I think we pray because we're created to pray. Prayer is hardwired within us. I'm convinced that, that every single one of us, one, every one of us, our souls long to connect to the one who created us. And even if we're not sure of his identity, even if we don't really believe in him, even when he seems distant, we long to connect. We pray because we're empty. We, we pray because we're grateful. We pray because we're scared. We pray because we feel helpless. We pray for the answers on a test. We pray for test results from a lab. We pray for a deal to go through at work. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for strength. We pray for peace. We pray for assurance that we're not alone. I mean, you hit some unexpected turbulence on an airplane, and everyone's praying. I mean, we can't help it, right? In fact, the word prayer comes from the Latin root precarious, from which we get the English word precarious. We pray out of desperation. We pray in precarious situations that we have nowhere else to turn. We can't help it, so we pray. You search the Bible, you search the pages of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and you see that all these different kinds of people, they prayed. And since the beginning of time, people have prayed. Abraham prayed. Moses prayed, and in fact, those two guys actually negotiated with God and changed God's mind. David prayed, Nehemiah prayed, Daniel prayed, Ezekiel prayed, Ruth prayed, Elijah prayed. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes for us in the book after him, says Elijah was a normal guy just like you and I. He prayed for rain. Now, you've got to keep in mind, this is after three and a half years of drought. There was no rain. It was totally dry. And Elijah prayed for it to rain, and it rained. Mary prayed, Peter prayed, Paul prayed, Jesus prayed. And over and over in the Gospels it said that Jesus would go off by himself to be quiet, and he would pray. In fact, there's one time where Peter finds Jesus, and there's this hint of frustration in Peter's voice. Peter says, Jesus, where have you been? I mean, we've been looking everywhere for you. Did you turn your cell phone off? We, we, we've been trying to find you. Where have you been? And Jesus seemed to always disappear, go off by himself, find some quiet place to pray. Jesus knew the value of prayer. He knew that prayer was basically connecting to God. Prayer is experiencing the presence and the power of God. And so when doubt starts to creep in and I start to wonder if prayer really matters at all, I'm reminded that Jesus, the one who spoke the universe into being, felt this compelling need to pray. See, Jesus' number one passion was talking to his Father, and I think this ability to move through life with courage and joy and the incredible energy that he had 
to love people in that radical, inclusive way that he loved people. His ability to teach with wisdom and clarity, I think all of that flowed out of a time of prayer. He embraced prayer as a lifeline. Do you know the only thing that the disciples, Jesus' disciples, ever asked Jesus to teach them? They didn't say, Jesus, hey, can you show us that water to wine trick? That was pretty cool. We'd like to learn how to do that. They, they didn't ask him, hey, hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to multiply bread? That, that was pretty cool. Can you show us how to do that? They didn't say, hey, how did you do that wave walking experience on the lake? That, that was awesome. Teach us how to do that. No, the disciples of Jesus, they came to him and said, Jesus, we see how you pray. We see how it's changing your life. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. You see, all they ever saw in their culture were these polished, well-crafted, public performance prayers of self-righteous religious leaders. And when they saw, when they saw this real life-giving connection that prayer gave to Jesus, they wanted that too. They asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And James also writes in James chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So why pray? We pray because we're hardwired to pray. We're created to pray. And we also pray because prayer is powerful and effective. You know, the prayer, James says, of a righteous person, that that doesn't mean that that is a perfect person. doesn't mean that we have a righteousness of our own. James here is talking about a person that humbly admits that the only way that they're ever going to be righteous or right or good is through Jesus Christ. He's talking about someone that humbles himself before God, pours out his heart. And when you do that, he says that prayer is powerful and it's effective. It changes the way that I see myself and the way that I see God. When I am talking to God, it enables me to embrace the smallness and lean into his bigness. It enables me to see that God has this incredible view from above and that he can see things that we cannot see. His his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are, are wider than our thoughts. His wisdom is bigger. His love is deeper. His view from above is much better than my view. Prayer brings that back into focus for me. And when I pray, it helps me recognize that someone is bigger, someone is better, someone smarter, wiser, more creative than I am. Prayer gives me this healthy awareness of God's hugeness, his immensity in God's presence. I feel really, really small because I am really, really small. Now, God doesn't need to be reminded of that reality. I do every day. Philip Yancey in his excellent book, Prayer, says this, prayer, and only prayer, restores my vision to one that resembles God's. I wake from the blindness to see that wealth lurks as a terrible danger, not a, as a goal worth striving for. The value depends not on race or status, but on the image of God every person bears, that no amount of effort to improve physical beauty has much relevance for the world beyond. When I pray, it brings all of that into reality, that there is a better way to live. There are better things to live for. There are better ways to define success. There are much more noble passions that I can pursue. There is so much wisdom in in this small little phrase that we learn in Psalm 46, verse 10, which says, Be still and know that I am God. This phrase, be still, actually means to vacate. We get our English word vacation from the word that's used here. Ever pray for vacation? (laughs) Absolutely, need one right now, right? God invites us to take a break. He invites us to come down from our corner CEO office of our life and let him be in charge. He, He says, you know, I've got a great idea. Why don't I be God today? Why don't you just go ahead, you take the day off. 
And prayer is so much more than a shopping list of I want this or I need that. It's coming to the reality of the universe and I am not the center of it. I'm not the star of the show. I'm simply a much loved small bit player in the grand story of God. I'm not the lead. I'm not the director or the producer or the script writer. This is God's story, and I am simply invited to play a small part in it. It's all about his greatness, his glory, his goodness, and his plan. And prayer brings that all back into focus for me. That is the power of prayer. That is the effectiveness of prayer. Prayer is experiencing the presence and the power of God. Why pray? Jesus wants us to pray. He invites us to pray. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. Keep doing it because God is our Father, and He wants to give what is best to His kids. You know, when I ask, one of my kids asks <clears throat> ask me for something, I really want to give them everything they want. I really do. But sometimes I, I need to have the wisdom to know what's best for them. And sometimes one of the best answers I can give my kids is no, no. And sometimes I think we, we get this idea, this picture of God as an unblinking, inflexible, stubborn old man who's says that his mind is made up and he doesn't want to hear anymore. But the reality is, I can bring my deepest secrets, my hurts, my habits, my hang-ups, my greatest joys, my gratitude. I can bring my doubts, my fears, my gripes, my complaints, my worries. I can bring it all to God in prayer. One writer said, I, I can't imagine one of my kids coming to me, standing at attention, saluting and saying, Oh, glorious potentate, founder of this family, the one who doth cloth me, feed me, and provide me with every good and perfect gift, might I crawleth up onto thy lap in order to snuggle. Of course not. Our kids just raise up their hands and say, Daddy, can I sit on your lap? I mean, if prayer is is just to come close to God, to be personal with God. We just need to talk normal with God. He understands. And of course, we come to him with respect, and reverence, and awe, of course. But you come to him, the Bible says, we can come to him in, in confidence, with confidence, because he loves us. First that's. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul reminds us, be joyful always, pray continually, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray continually. Pray all the time. You know, I'm doing good to pray five minutes in the morning. Pray all the time. What in the world is Paul talking about here? It means that you keep your mind open and receptive to the presence and the power of God. You are connected to God. You've got this constant conversation that's going on with God. And I think you do for sure, carve out time every single day that you connect with God. But I think it's more than that. I think it's more than just simply that, that five minutes or ten minutes of just sitting there talking, listening to God. It's, it's more of an ongoing, all-day conversation with God. You know, maybe, maybe it looks like this for you. You're sitting in your office. You say, all right, God, I've got this. Two o'clock meeting is a really important meeting. You know it's a really big deal for me. You know all about this meeting, but I just want to bring this to you, to your attention. I just want to share with you that I'm, I'm concerned about it. I'm anxious about it. I'm, I'm nervous about this, this meeting. I, I just want to give this meeting to you. God, I want to ask that you give me the wisdom to know when to speak and the wisdom to know when to be silent. Give me discernment. Give me the insight to know when to act and when to hold back. Lord, I have no idea what this, is, this meeting is going to go, how it's going to go, but I just give this meeting to you. And you go into that meeting, you're having this meeting, and you're just continuing to pray, God, give me the wisdom to know when to speak and when to be silent. Lord, help me not be defensive. Help me just to, to figure out solutions to the problem in this meeting. Lord, I just give this meeting to you. And then you walk out of that meeting and you just lift up to God. And to God, I don't know what in the world happened in that meeting, but 
but I just gave that meeting to you, and you worked. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I just trust you through all that. Maybe for you, maybe it's you're in your car, and you're driving home, and you pray, God, I'm just a couple minutes away from home. I'm about to, to go inside, and you know how tired I am. I'm exhausted. I don't know if I have any energy to give, but I, I want to, to be joy, to bring joy to my family. I, I want to bring energy to my family. I want to do what I can to meet their needs. And I know we're all tired, so Lord, help me to be the father and husband that you need me to be, that my family needs me to be. Maybe, maybe you're going in for a risky surgery and you have no, out, no idea what the outcome's going to be. And you just say, God, you know that I'm going into the surgery. I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but I just trust myself to you. You know what is best. You're the great physician. You're the healer. And I just trust you in the midst of this. And when you do that, all day, every day. It's effective, it's powerful, it's honest, it's personal. It's staying connected to the presence and the power of God. Now what does this mean for us? Where do we go from here? What are some next steps that we can put some of this into place? Well, let me just say, if you're not praying on a consistent basis, start small. Start with five minutes every day. Just set aside a time, a space, and just spend with God. Be still. Put your computer away. Put your phone away. Maybe have a pad of paper and a pen. And just write. Maybe a thought or a prayer or a concern. Just write it down. Pray that back to God. Maybe read a verse or two of Scripture. You're just slowing yourself, being in the presence, experiencing the presence and the power of God. Take five minutes. And after you do that, consistently over time, maybe add another five minutes or 10 minutes. It's not about the length of time, the duration of time. It's about being in the presence of God, connecting with him, loving him, allowing him to love you. Embrace that. Another way that you can put this into practice is join our prayer warrior team. Maybe you, you love to pray you love to lift people up. Maybe you scour through Facebook for looking for people to pray for. You love to pray. Well, Melissa Snyder, she is going to be out in the auditorium, our atrium, our, our atrium, our lobby area, and she's going to uh, uh, want to talk with you. She'd like to include you as part of our, our prayer team. Pray, people have prayer requests. People share those with us. We have a group of people who who pray in faith for each of those concerns. And if you'd like to be part of that, you'd, you'd like to receive an email blast of prayer concerns, uh, you can sign up with Melissa. Also, prayer events that we have, uh, she would glad uh, be glad to have you join a part of planning those prayer events. And today is also a day that we set aside for what we call healing prayer. It's a, it's a day where our shepherds, are here. They're, they're, they're ready. They're available 24-7, but this is a special time we set aside that if someone wants to be prayed for in faith, to be anointed with oil, you want healing, maybe physical healing, mental healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, they will pray in faith for you and anoint you with oil. Again, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this in verse 14 and verse 15 of James 5, is any one of you sick? He should call the elders, the shepherds of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And that's the critical component here is, is that it is prayed in faith and in the end it is the Lord who will raise that person up. See, there was incredible power when Jesus was crucified, when he was buried, and on that third day he came back to life. That was resurrection power, and that's the power that Jesus will use to raise you up. And so today you can meet with one or two of our shepherds. You can either uh, just stay in here in the auditorium. They will, they will come to you. They will pray with you. You can go into the prayer room just outside this room. 
and one of our shepherds will meet you there. You know, our shepherds, they desire God's will. They desire God's purpose for your life. They desire what is good and right and whole for your life. So why pray? Why pray? Because we're created to pray. Why pray? Because it is powerful and effective. And we pray because Jesus invites us to pray. Let's do that right now. Almighty God, we are so grateful to be able to be together, to be in our presence. Lord, you know exactly what we're facing. You know the concerns that we have in our heart, the things that we struggle with, the burdens that we're bearing right now. You know the the hurt, the habits, the hang-ups that we struggle with. I pray, Father, that you are at work in those situations right now. Lord, we just want to honor you too right now. We ask that you are blessed, you are lifted high, you are praised. The words that we speak, the silence of our heart, may you be pleased. You know what we need even before we ask, but you desire for us to ask because you love us. Thank you, Lord, for being near to us, the love you have for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good when we draw near to God. Through our worship, through our prayer, we're able to draw near to the Creator. One act, one amazing act of grace and love. It's because of this that when we pray, we can know that God is hearing us. We can know that He's right there with us. He has a hope for you, a future. When He looks down upon us, He doesn't see our sin and our brokenness, our heartaches or our pains, what he sees is the righteousness of Christ covering us. It's because Jesus willingly went to that cross. It's because his body was broken. His blood was poured out for us. And we can draw near. the gap he made a way and in that single action he adopted us into the family it's good to draw near we do that each and every week here through the taking of our elements of communion you should have gotten those when you came in today if you didn't there's some available in the back as I always say to you, the pull tabs and get you to the bread and the juice, symbol of Jesus' body broken for us, his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. So as we continue this act of worship, I want you to draw near to our Heavenly Father, our Creator God, and reach out to him. Abba, Father, you'll find that he's right there for you. The hope and a future to wrap you up and hold you. So I want you to take a few moments and draw near to our God as you take your communion.
you do. God, I know that you love me and I thank you for hearing my prayers. Heavenly Father, I know that you love each and every one of us. And I thank you for hearing our prayers. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice which brought us into the fold made us new. Heavenly Father, here we are. Lord, speak to us. Be 
If you would like prayer, you can stay where you're at or you can go out to our prayer room. Otherwise, have a blessed week.